All right, so today we're talking about Kant. But before we talk about Kant, let's talk about deontology versus teleology. We already talked, we just seconds ago, we were talking about teleology and about the fact that teleology is an emphasis on consequences, on the results of whatever action you take. Deontology also comes from a Greek word and is focused on what? What's the opposite of, when we're talking about ethics, what do we imagine is the opposite of consequences? Like we could, oh, what? Crystal, what? Benefits? Well, I think benefits are consequences, right? Those are the results. Yeah, those are good consequences, yeah. But what else might, like if I want to decide if I should lie about why I couldn't make it to class today, all right, I could figure out what the consequences will be, consequences will be of that lie. Like, ooh, if I lie and get caught, I'll get in trouble, all right? That's or if I lie and don't get caught, things are good. So that seems reasonable. That's consequences again, pros and cons, right? Results, positives, the the positive consequences of this action versus the negative consequences of this action. Is that? It's not lack of consequences. Everything has consequences, right? But it's it's not looking at the consequences to determine whether something is right or wrong. Crystal actually mentioned this in class the other day. The thing that we, the other thing that we might look at when we are trying to decide if something is right or wrong. I promise you did, Crystal. Think back, replay that conversation in your head, that discussion. Actually, I, I can put the definition of deontology up here on the board because I looked it up for you. Right? Deontology is based on duty, moral obligation, right action in the sense of intention. Right? Why do you do a thing? Should you, right? Should, is it good because it leads to good consequences or is it good just because it's good? Right? Something like that. Is the action itself a right action as opposed to does it lead to good consequences? Great example. Imagine that your neighbors have gone away for the winter and you know that they are returning tomorrow. So you go over to their house, you happen to have keys because you're those kinds of neighbors. And you go over to their house and you turn on the furnace so that when they get home, the house will be nice and warm, All right? But sadly, you did not know that there was a fault in the furnace somewhere. And so when the family comes home, they arrive to a smoldering pile of ashes because their house has burnt down. Okay. So, the teleology, the utilitarian says what about your decision to go over there and turn on the furnace? Marissa, what? Yeah, but the utilitarian doesn't care about intentions. What does the utilitarian care about? Consequences. So, the utilitarian says, that was a bad move. That was morally wrong. You did something that led to the burning down of someone's house which of course makes those people sad and the right increases ha pain more than it increases happiness boo right the deontologist looks at that action and says well whatever the consequences were what were your intentions did you intend to do something good presumably right you didn't go over there right if you went over there with the express purpose of burning their house down that's bad, right? But if you went over there just to warm up their house and to make it nice and cozy and comfy for them, then that's good. Even if it leads to the house burning down. Because of course, that's not what you intended, right? And utilitarian, the whole, the whole thing gets weird, right? Because we could imagine the, uh, and this is where things really, I think the pr one of the serious problems with utilitarianism, right? You s same action, same thing. If you go over there and you turn on that furnace and it just so happens that that whole family has come down with the flu over the course of their vacation and they walk into their nice, warm, cozy house and they find it just heaven. Like this is the most amazing, thoughtful thing anyone's ever done for them because they were sick and they just wanted that house to be warm when they walked in and they go straight to bed and they don't have to worry about it. Yay. Same action ends up being a good action 
just because the circumstances changed. And that seems like a problem for utility, for utility. Whereas a deontologist is looking at the action and saying, is, it, is that action right? Is it good because it's good? Yeah. Yes, the intent. And so, as you might have guessed, Kantian ethics are an example, Kantian ethics are an example of deontology. This is a deontological system. It's not looking at the consequences of the action so much as the action itself, whether it is right or wrong. Kant, of course, right? Kantian ethics, named after this guy, Immanuel Kant, who uh, lived 1724 to 1804, uh, right in that age of the uh, rationalism movement where people were all right, trying to re rethink the way the world worked and the way people worked using reason rather than relying on uh, hocus pocus or religion or superstition or anything else, right? They were trying to see if they couldn't sit down and figure out all of the physics and metaphysics and so on of the world. Um, and so Kant, a big fan Kant, or of, of reason, Kant used that to try to explain everything. He wrote lots of books about lots of different things. He, he knew about calculus and biology and physics. He wrote three different books about the way the world, the way people think, right? Depending on the situations they're in and the different reasons they do different things and, and so on. So uh, Kant was pretty amazing. He wrote a lot uh, right up until he died. Uh, wrote a lot. He lived, he was born and he grew up in Konigsberg, which is, uh, was in Prussia, is now, I believe, Kaliningrad in Russia, um, is the name of the, the city today. Um, anyway, and went to the University of Konigsberg, became a professor at the University of Konigsberg, uh, never married, just wrote his whole life. Um, uh, apparently was a very popular teacher. Uh, kids, kids liked him. Um, and so he came up with this idea of ethics based around the, uh, the really sort of fundamentally based around the idea of goodwill. So we could think about it in terms of teleology, you know, focuses on the consequences of our actions. Deontology is focused on having a good will, right? If the person who goes over to heat up the furnace for the neighbor's house does that with good will, was what Kant would call it, we might call it good intention, then it's fundamentally a good action, regardless of the consequences. Whether the house burns down or the house warms the flu sick people, doesn't matter, doesn't change the goodness or badness of that action. It was either good or bad before we ever figured out what the consequences were, All right? Remember the Robin Hood example that we talked about last week, right? For a deontologist, stealing is bad. And it doesn't matter whether that stolen money goes to start a halfway house or it goes to a drug den, right, or whatever. It was the act of stealing that was bad, and it doesn't matter what you do with what the consequences are at the end of the day. Yes? Yes? To that point, this is a quotation from from Kant's grounding for metaphysics of morals. All of his book titles were these long, very pompous sounding things. Um, and this is actually a really great sentence about sort of his idea of uh, the goodwill, right? Notice I've capitalized it because it's important uh, for him. The goodwill, even if this will, this goodwill, right, is what I'm talking about there. Even if this good intention should be wholly lacking in the power to accomplish its purpose. What does he mean? Couldn't achieve what you set out to do. Think of a thing, a good thing, right? A thing with good will, a good intent, good intention that you might have. Even if you're totally incapable of doing that thing, whatever it might be, for whatever reason. If with the greatest effort, it should yet achieve nothing. So even if you try as hard as you possibly can to achieve whatever that good thing is, and only the goodwill should remain. So there are no positive consequences. Maybe there are even negative consequences. But if the only, even if the only thing that remains to you is that good intention at the end of the day, 
and I'll get to the parentheses in a second. Yet, would it, like a jewel, it gets a little poetic there, like a jewel, still shine by its own light as something which has its full value in itself? How important is the goodwill to Kant? Extremely important. Even if there were nothing else, it would still shine forth like a jewel, full of its own value. The intention is the thing that determines the value of an action, regardless of whether it actually accomplishes anything, provided that what? Started out as a good intention, and there's another, there's another requirement there. That's the parentheses. Not to be sure as a mere wish, but as the summoning of all the means in our power. So it has to have, be a, have goodwill, be a good intention, and, yeah, you actually have to try. Right? You actually have to, like, I can't just sit at home and think, man, it would be great if every little kid had a puppy. Right? Maybe that would be a good intention and goodwill. But if I don't get up and actually try and make sure that every kid has a puppy, which is probably impossible at the end of the day, Right? But if I try to do that and it doesn't work out, it's just as good as if I tried it and it did work out. As long as I tried as hard as I could with good intention. Yes? So again, its usefulness, it being the will, its usefulness or fruitlessness can neither augment nor diminish this value. Meaning its actual effect on society or its lack thereof cannot change its value. Goodwill is the most valuable part of being good, according to Kant. Does that make sense? Tony, you're making the squinty face. Does it make sense? Can anybody explain what I just said, maybe in better words than I used? I'll take that as a compliment. <laughs> If you meant to do the best you could, even if you fail, that's that's basically that's good enough. Not just good enough, right? I think we we tend to throw that word enough on the end. Well, it's it's, it's straight up good. It's just as good. If you have a good, if you if there's something that you want to do, and it is a good thing, right? Donating to charity, uh, saving puppies, uh, I don't know, whatever, feeding the homeless. Even if it turns out you can't do that thing, you, I'm going to go feed all the homeless. Oh my gosh, I only have $5 in my bank account. I'm not going to feed all the homeless. But if you really, really meant to do it and you tried as hard as you could, that's, that is just as good as actually feeding the homeless, according to Kant. That action is just as good. Obviously, the consequences aren't as good because you don't have any, right? They're not fed, right? But that's not what Kant cares about. He's not concerned about the actual consequences of your actions so much as he is about the intent with which you do them, attempt them. Does that make sense? Okay. What's the potentially obvious question that, that Kant still has to answer? And he's going to, but that maybe we need for him to answer. Patrick? How do you know when someone put all of their that, I, I, thought you were, I thought you were going to be there. That's, that's almost it. That's, I think that's a different question. I think that's up to the person to establish for himself. I think, right, we're not, Kant's not here with like a, he's not grading people, right? Oh, you, uh, I feel like you probably could have spent another hour on that paper, right? Uh, that, that's me. Um, the, right, I don't, he's not worried so much about establishing whether or not you actually put your effort, full effort into it. Um, I think that's something that we can do after the fact. I think that's a valuable thing sometimes to determine really how good someone is, right? In the sense of like, hi, I run a mega church in Texas, for example, and I really care about people and I want to do everything I can to help them. However, I don't actually do that. Instead, I own a 4 million square foot mansion and a boat, right? Right, his, his, he says his intentions are one are good things, but then his actions, he's not following through with those. He's not trying as hard as he can to actually complete those things. So we can use, those, use that to judge. But I think there's another question that Kant needs to answer. Crystal, was your hand up a second ago? Yeah. 
well, hopefully they express them, right? Even if somebody expresses, like I say, my intention is to feed the homeless people. Okay, then we know his intention. But right, maybe he's lying, and we can probably base that, judge that on how hard he tries to actually complete his thing, which is I think of what Patrick was saying. But let's go back to the the goodwill, right? The will, as long as it is a good will, as long as it's a good intention, it's a good action. Pattern? Uh, okay. So what, how do you know if it's good? There you go. That's the question. How do you know if it's good? I'm going to go out and kick every puppy. <laughs> that doesn't seem good, but how do I know it's not? All right. How do I know it's not? Let's figure out how. And that's what Kant still has to answer. Right? So all he's given us is a sort of blanket sort of background like just so you know guys this is what we're this is where we're starting from and that is that we're not we're going to determine some some rules for how to figure out if something is a good action or a bad action because that's what ethics is about and i'm going to use reason to do it but just so we're clear i'm not focusing on the consequences of actions i'm focusing on the actions themselves right so he's just given us that sort of starting point questions Everyone's with me so far. And so we get to the categorical imperative, which sounds really impressive and cool, and it is. Did we answer the question? Did we? Did I? Did Patrick? Patrick, I think, did answer the question. Patrick, answer the question again. How do we know something is good? Yeah. Well, he's saying as long as the will is good, then the action is good. But what criteria are we using to determine if the will is good? Right? I mean, we're starting at Kant saying we're starting kind of at, at, at zero here. So in theory, any action could be, any will could be good, unless we have some system of differentiating between them. Right? So if, say, in my ethical theory, kicking puppies is good, then Kant's all Kant is saying is if you decide to go out and kick some puppies, as long as you really try to kick those puppies, it doesn't matter whether you actually kick them or not. Right? It's still a good action. Now, he's going to go on to say kicking puppies is not a good action, and here's why. That's all, we've, all we still have left to do. Uh, all, that's all we still have left to do. That's a big deal. Right? That's a big part of what we have left to do. Did that, Christine, did that answer your? Okay. Um, Kant believes that we come into conflict, well, that, that we have to make decisions when we have conflicts between our duty and our inclination. What do we mean by duty versus inclination? What you're supposed to do versus what you want to do. And, and Kant believes that we almost always want to do something other than what we ought to do. Right? That's that he thinks that's just human nature. Right? You should go out and donate your money to charity, but you really want to buy the big flat screen TV. Right? Sure, right? That that that's always a conflict between what you want to do and what you ought to do. That we have a duty versus an inclination. And um and so what we need is some sort of rule that helps us establish when we need to do our duty. Right, what we ought to do instead of what we want to do. And, um, and to do that, he believes that we need an imperative. What is an imperative? Or maybe some imperatives. What is an imperative, generally? It comes from the Latin word impero, imperare. It gives us the English word emperor. It is imperative that you do something. Important. It is a command. It's a command. An imperative is just a command, a rule, for lack of a better word, right? What's that? Is that what you said? All right. Good work. Good. An imperative is just a rule. I mean, it literally means a command, but right. The um, but that's the basic idea. And we have hypothetical imperatives all the time in our lives. Right? A hypothetical imperative is one that is specific to a particular situation. Right? Um, 
for example, uh, you when you when the light turns red, you ought to stop. But that's hypothetical because it's contingent upon the particular situations. Sometimes you don't stop, right? If there's an ambulance behind you, sometimes you run that red light in order to give space to the ambulance. Sometimes you've got a pregnant lady in the back seat and you've got to right, run the red light. Sometimes there aren't any lights, right? Sometimes, and so on, right? There are all sorts of different possibilities. And so we have lots of rules in our lives, uh, some of them more powerful than others. Um, for example, and I've, oh, I, I, I promised I would confess this. Uh, I ate at McDonald's last night. Right? Yeah, uh, I know, I know, I know. It's a shame for Matt. Uh, but right, you might have a rule like I don't eat at McDonald's. But then, right, sometimes you do because I had a million things to do and I didn't get dinner until 9:30, and right, that was the only thing I could I could get easily. So, so I did. Uh, but as you should know, I felt guilty as I ate it because I knew you guys would think less of me. I did it anyway, though. Um, and so these don't really help us. Because even if they're good imperatives, like thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, these are the kinds of imperatives that you guys are familiar with and that you think, that you've said in the past classes that you think are pretty good commands, right? imperatives. Even those have conditional conditions in which they don't apply. Right? Thou shalt not kill, well, unless... Right, self-defense, war, maybe capital punishment. All right, those are all examples where, well, okay, thou shalt kill. Uh, thou shalt not steal. Well, unless right, your children are starving and you absolutely need that bread. You know, da, 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 da. Right. Uh, and then Le Miz happens and it's chaos. Um, thank you for the few who chuckled. Um, what we need instead, says Kant, is a categorical imperative. A categorical imperative is an imperative, a command, a rule that it always works, always will help us to determine what is right and what is wrong. There is no point at which this imperative does not apply. Nothing could happen, according to Kant, that would make this rule not work. Right? It's impossible. And this is the categorical imperative that he comes up with. Always act, this is, and this is a commandment, right? This is, I wonder if I can, can I make this bigger? Can I zoom in? Uh, nope. <laughs> I mean, yes, but it becomes that much harder to see. Is that better? A little bit? Yeah, all right, okay. Categorical imperative is that you should always act so that you can will that your maxim can become a universal law. Oh, what does that mean? It's a lot of words. Right? That's why thou shalt, shalt not kill is so good, right? So punchy. All right? Just gets right in there. Says it in like four words. This is too many words. But what does it mean? Always act so that you can will that your maxim. What is a maxim? So a magazine with half-naked women on the covers. No. What is a maxim? A maxim in this case. A maxim can be a couple of different things. It can be sort of a. Sometimes it can be a motto. Sometimes it can be a, uh, a like a, a statement. Just a simple statement. In this case, by maxim we mean a description of your action. Whatever it is you're about to do. Think of whatever it is you're about to do. I'm about to kick a puppy. I'm, I shouldn't pick on puppies, but it's a good example, right? Nobody is in favor of kicking puppies, whereas people will argue with almost anything else I say, right? So puppy kicking is a good example. Dogs, on the other hand, people kick dogs. In puppy, nobody kicks puppies. Um, so imagine, right? I'm about to kick this puppy. Should I kick the puppy? My maxim is I'm going to kick this puppy. Right? That is a description of my activity. I'm about to kick a puppy. And so, always act so that you can will that your maxim, your description of your activity, can become a universal law. What do I mean by a universal law? What? Thou shalt not kick puppies. Uh, sort of, but that's backwards, right? 
Yeah, yeah. not just everybody should kick puppies. That's what you have to do, right? You have to stop and and think about the idea, right? Can I imagine a world in which my maxim becomes a universal law? Right? I'm about to kick puppies. Or I mean we could change that to it's okay to kick puppies, something like that. All right. Universal, I mean you I can universalize that maxim. I imagine a world in which everybody acts in the way that I'm about to act. Is that a world in which I want to live? Probably not. Right? I don't probably want to live in a world in which everybody kicks puppies. Right? This is not the best example. I'm going to give you a better example in a second. Um, and so if I don't want everybody to be a puppy kicker, I shouldn't be a puppy kicker either. Yes? But basically what it boils down to. Here's a better example. I am broke. And I need, why is that funny? That's sad. It's not funny. I'm broke. Uh, I am broke, and I need to borrow some money. Well, I figure out that a way to be not broke is to borrow some money from my neighbor. So I'm going to go borrow some money from Bob, who lives next door. I'm going to borrow 100 bucks. But I know I'm not going to pay that money back. I know I'm not. I, I like I, I don't have a hundred dollars. I'm unlikely to come up with a hundred dollars in the near future. There's really there's really like no world in which this hundred dollars ever makes its way back to Bob. All right. So um so I know that. So my maxim that I'm about to act on is I'm going to borrow money that I know I will never repay. Right? And so I want to universalize that maxim. All right? What if I lived in a world where everybody borrowed money with no intention of repaying it? What would that do? What would be, I don't want to say the consequences of that, but imagine that world. No one would ever lend money. There would not be student loans. There would not be student loans. There would not be any loans, period, right? No one would ever lend money to anyone. And so, and this is important, it's not just that it would lead to like bad results. It would actually nullify the very action that you're trying to do at all if everybody acted in the way that I'm about to act. Because I would be unable, if everybody acted the way I'm about to act, I would be unable to do what I'm about to do. It's logically, logically impossible. And so, should I borrow the money with no intention of paying it back? No, because then I would not be acting in a way such that I could imagine that maxim becoming a universal law. Lying, another example, right? This is, we can post, remember all those things that Rachel's talked about as sort of fundamental rules for society? Those are all really good examples here, right? Lying, if I lie to somebody, right, then I have to imagine what if I lived in a world where everybody was free to lie? Well, then no one would believe anything anyone ever said. No one would ever talk to anybody else again. We'd never be able to even lie to one another. It's logically inconsistent that we could universalize lying because communication itself would fall apart. You know? um, does this make sense? This is obviously similar to the thing we've already talked about once, right, when we were talking about egoism, sort of the, we, in egoism, we changed this. What does this remind us of, other than the thou shalt nots? Yeah, classic golden rule, right? This should remind us a little bit of the golden rule, right? You do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Kant was not a fan of the golden rule for the same reasons that I've already mentioned, right? He doesn't like the idea of, like, if I'm a weirdo, then I want you to treat me badly, then, then, I want to, then I should treat you badly. That's not, right? That's, Kant's not a big fan of that. But it's the same kind of imperative, right? That is an example of a categorical imperative. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Kant just thinks it's a bad example of a categorical imperative. This, he thinks, is a better working of essentially the golden rule, establishing that rather than worrying about like what I want done or what you want done, instead, let's imagine the whole world acting away, what would that world be like? Yes? 
Does it make sense? Okay. What do we think about it? But before you start looking at criticisms, <laughs> what do we think? So let, let me give you a different example. Let me give you a different example. Um, you run a store, and you're trying to decide whether or not to like cheat your customers by like I don't know selling. Say you you run a deli, and somebody comes in and orders. I want like a pound of roast beef. And you, because no one weighs that stuff, right? It's not like you go home and you check that it was actually a pound, right? You could pretty easily get away with, wow, it never occurred to me until just now, actually, that you should probably go home and check that. Anyway, the store could pretty easily get away with giving you like three quarters of a pound instead of a pound, and you never know, right? And they charge you for the pound, and so you're getting ripped off because you're getting only 75% of what you ordered. But, um, but that is a thing that you can do as a store owner. Should you do that? Probably not, right? It seems, seems like that's, that's not cool. That's not a cool thing to do to your, to your customers. Um, but we're going to talk about, this, there's another reason why that might feel weird in a second, like why that feels weird. But what isn't, what doesn't apply here is, right? Why would you maybe not, right? What are some obvious reasons not to rip off your customers? Crystal. Right. Right. So the things that so that's a good reason. Let's come. Let me just quickly touch upon bad reasons that refer back to other things we've talked about. Right. A utilitarian is going to say, "Don't do that." Why? What's that? Because of happiness. In what way? It'll make people sad. They won't even notice. It won't make them sad. Won't be able to feed as many people. Well, I think the more important, the more sort of personal thing is I might get caught. And that will make me sad, right? So, and you'll lose a customer. That's right. And probably many customers, right? So, uh, utilitarian says, don't cheat the customers because you could get caught. But that's obviously focused on, focused on consequences, right? Consequences. And Kant doesn't care about consequences. So, that's not going to be Kant's motive for not cheating the customers. Another response might be, well, I like my customers, right? I would never cheat these customers. They're like, they live in my neighborhood. They're good people. I like serving them. I love it when the little kids come in and buy candy and da 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 da, -da. And the little old ladies, I, I like them. Why is that not a good motive? Yeah, right? What if, what if like, you know, your jerky ex-wife comes in? Right, and then you're like, oh yeah, back to three quarters of roast beef for you, right? That's not a good answer because that's not. Furthermore, right? That's about what is, who is that ultimately about? That's about self-benefit, right? That makes me happy to serve these people, and so that's going back to egoism, right? That makes me happy to be nice, but it could just as easily make you happy. Depending, right? I really need some extra cash this week or something like that. It could make you just as happy to be not nice. Right, so that's not a super great way to determine what's right or wrong here. Even though we we feel again, common sense tells us it's not right to cheat your customers, but utilitarianism doesn't really give us a great reason, and neither does egoism not to. Kant is going to say it's not right to cheat your customers because you wouldn't want everybody to start cheating people because then nobody would buy anything from anyone because they'd be constantly worried about being cheated. And so world falls apart and nobody sells anything. Yes? 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 Um, obviously, there are some... When we talk about your, your maxim, it's going to depend upon your circumstances. Right? Like, um, like we were talking about before, right? we can imagine a world in which you know, we shouldn't speed Right? We shouldn't drive over the speed limit because it's not safe. And if we imagine a world in which everybody drove over the speed limit, that would be a bad thing, right? Although everybody does, so maybe this is a bad example. But but then we can say, but what about we've got a pregnant lady in the back? I gotta get to the hospital. Right. And so Kant might be might be comfortable with saying, okay, okay, okay. Right. Everybody who doesn't have a pregnant lady in the back shouldn't speed. Right? 
But if you've got a pregnant lady in the back, then your maxim has changed. Would I be comfortable with everybody who has a pregnant lady in the backseat of the car speeding to the hospital? Yeah, I don't know, maybe. Maybe. That seems okay. Right? So now our maxim here has changed a little, and that's all right. It's, it's universal as long as I can establish that that circumstance applies to everyone. Everyone who has a pregnant lady in the back, is it okay if every single person who has a pregnant lady in the back is able to speed? Sure, sure right, right. I should say who's like just about to give birth, not just a random pregnant lady. I'm six weeks pregnant. Go anywhere you want. Ah! Um, that's, not, that's not what I meant. Right. Um, Yes, are we okay with this? It's it's really pretty much that that simple. We're gonna get we're gonna complicate it a little bit more in a second down below where you can see. Mm. It depends, I think, on what you mean by specific. Yeah. Yes and no. So I'm going to repeat that because I noticed that I was watching my video and nobody who's watching the video can hear anything that you guys are saying, which may free you up, make you feel better a little bit. Because now that I'm using the microphone, like you might feel more comfortable to just say crazy stuff because nobody can hear you on the computer. Um, that's okay. All right. Feel free to do that. Um, so I, so so you're suggesting that this is just like the golden rule, Tracy, similar to the golden rule, except. So this is focused on an act rather than general, just, just. I mean, do one to others is focused on acts too, right? Yes, but it's broad. Broad, yeah. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think this is just a language difference there. Um, I mean, because this is supposed to be really broad too, right? This is always act so that you can will that each thing you do, right? That's wow, hugely broad, but then you're narrowing it in each time. When you, when you think about the golden rule, we're so used to that, that formulation of it, do unto others, that we don't really realize that what's being said there is act towards others each time as in a way that you would want them to act toward you each time. So, right, so it is actually fairly specific. I mean, it could be interpreted to be specifically aimed at each action as well, I suppose. Um, the real difference here is that it's not about you at all. It's about everyone else, right? It's not, right, so there's no possibility of you of there being a weird circumstance about you liking to be poorly treated or you just not wanting to deal with people um, or the person that you're acting to being weird, right? We're talking about everyone at once, which, which levels the playing field, right? The larger the sample, the, the smaller the impact of outliers. Yeah, does that make sense? Um, yes, does it make sense to, to everybody? Are we okay with this? Okay. Okay. Now, there's people who have criticized this theory. Because, I mean, that's it. That's basically it. That's the whole thing, right? You always want to act in a way that you want everybody to act. Um, some people have commented that Kant is actually kind of cheating a little bit here, right? Because we imagine, right, if I imagine a world, what happens when I imagine a world in which I'm allowed to borrow things from my neighbor and never return them? Like, I imagine that world. What happens in that world? No one lends anything to anybody. Aren't I thinking about consequences then? I'm establishing that's a negative consequence. So aren't I thinking about consequences? Aren't we actually looking at consequences? Consequences when we universalize our maxim? Hmm. Are we? Yes, good, thank you for answering. No, Kant's gonna say, not really, not really. How can we not be? What was that, I'm sorry, what part? There is, Kant says, it doesn't matter what the consequences are. 
because it's about intent, right? So, but Khan's got to back that up, right? It sounds, he's saying all the right things about it's about intent, but it, but it sounds like he's actually focusing on consequences. Does anybody see how he gets around this? No. He's not really, because this isn't the world, right? We don't live in a world in which everybody borrows neighbor's tools and never returns them, or borrows money and doesn't return them, or, or kicked puppies, or whatever, right? It's an imaginary world, it's hypothetical. There are no actual consequences, right? There are cons and and what he's definitely not looking at is the consequences of this action. I ought not to kick this puppy because it will hurt the puppy, or I ought to kick the puppy because it will train the puppy not to pee on the floor. Right? That's he, he's not looking at those things. He's saying, is it right to kick puppies? Is it right for everyone to kick puppies when they feel like it? He's not looking at any actual consequences. Those are hypothetical imaginings. A world in which everybody kicked puppies. Because we don't live in that world for real. There aren't any actual consequences. Yes? Does that make sense? So even though okay. I say that, you know, my, in my mind, I'm thinking as a categor categorical imperative that. So let me think. I am not going to kick puppies, so I don't want everybody else in the world to kick puppies. It's the other way around. I don't want everyone else in the world to kick puppies, right. so I'm not going to kick so puppies. Yes. Right. 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 Yes. Yes. And and right. You are you are just talking about your personal action, right? Um. And potentially, if you were to come across someone else who was also kicking a puppy, you could say, you know, you probably would not want to universalize that maxim, so you should not kick that puppy, right? Which is not, you know. Everyone's been kicking puppies and it's been messing up the world, right? That's looking at consequences. This is just saying it's wrong to kick puppies because that is not the sort of maxim that we would want to become a universal law. Ought not to drop phones because they break. That is looking at consequences. Um, furthermore, just so we're clear, I tried to, it's, this is a hard thing to wrap your head around. I'm just going to say it and maybe you'll get it, maybe you won't. It's not the end of the world if you don't. Um, that bit about logical, logical impossibility that I was talking about before, like if we, if we lie to people, if we universalize lying, then communication falls apart. If we universalize stealing, then ownership of property falls apart and there's nothing left to steal. If we, if we universalize cheating one another in, in financial transactions, then capitalism falls apart and personal property falls apart and there's nothing left to buy, right? That sort of thing. That's logical impossibility. Those are the sorts of things that that Kant is worried about. He's not worried about, oh, like if I am mean to puppies, then the world will be full of meanies, right? That's worrying about consequences. He's not worried about that kind of kind of crappy consequence. Like I we shouldn't all buy used cars because they break down and that bums us all out, right? That's not what he's suggesting. He's talking about universalizing rules that lead to logical impossibilities then. And those things are always bad. Does that make sense? So he's really, really not looking at consequences. He's looking at logic and the way that logic works its way out and leads to, to impossibilities. Not good consequences versus bad consequences. Okay. What about, so, so our friend Kant was talking about, and stop me if you have questions, stop me. Um, our friend Kant here, they're only the five, uh, was worried about, well, he's talking about duty versus inclination, right? We have to, when we find ourselves in a situation where we feel like we ought to do something versus we want to do something, we use a categorical imperative to help us determine whether or not we actually ought to do that thing or whether we can do what we want to do. But what happens when we are dealing with duty versus duty? How does the categorical imperative help us there? For example, you, uh, and remember that both duties by his definition are things we don't really want to do. So maybe you should stay late at work and wrap up this inventory thing, which will be tedious and boring and you're not gonna get paid extra for it. or you should go home and study for a test you have tomorrow. Neither one of them is anything you want to do. 
how do we use the categor categorical imperative there to help us make a decision? What ought we to do? What is the right thing to do? Should I stay at work and, compl and do this tedious, boring, blah, blah, blah thing? Or should I go home and study for this test, which also will not be very fun? But we don't care about consequences. Or at least Kant doesn't care about consequences. Yeah, but if nobody studies for their tests, then nobody's going to get their college degrees and no one pass with the eight. You know? uh, I don't know that there's a good answer to this one, actually. This is a, this is a problem. Categorical imperative might not actually help us in these kinds of circumstances. And then we need, uh, and that seems to be maybe a problem with it. It doesn't, s I mean, I think what we do instead, how, how do we resolve this problem normally? And I think, Taishan, you just touched upon it. <laughs> well, right, you start to do what? You can't do both. I mean, you could, but you do both of them poorly. Right? Can't do both. Yeah, right. You start looking at consequences because bah, what else are you going to do, right? You start doing the pros and cons. You revert to. You revert. What do you revert to? What did we talk about last week? Thank you. Yes, utilitarianism. That's what we end up doing, right? We revert to utilitarianism because we're like, well, if I stay at work, I impress my boss. Right, and I get this done. I won't have to do it tomorrow, which makes my life easier next week. I don't know. If I go home and study for the test, I do well on the test. That's better for my college, my grades, GPA. Da, 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 da. But we don't really want to be in a situation where we're like picking and choosing from different theories of ethical behavior. Right? We really want one that works instead of like, well, today I'll be utilitarian and tomorrow I'll believe in Kant, right? Um, that's not, this, not the way we want to go about this. I don't know that there's a great answer to this. It might be that, that Kant's theory is just too focused on like right versus wrong and doesn't apply to like day-to-day, -day, like should I buy premium gas or regular, right? If there's no category, what if everyone bought premium gas, right? It's not, that just doesn't apply here. It just doesn't matter. And so maybe it doesn't help us to make decisions that don't have real ethical ramifications. Like, for example, uh, it would be different if I said, right, if I had promised my boss that I was going to stay and do that work, right? Now, right, I'm in the position of maybe do I keep my word or do I go home and study for that test that I'm really worried about? Well, right, do we, now we're in a position where are we comfortable with people breaking their promises? because they really want to, right? Well, probably not, because that's essentially lying, and we know what lying does, right? If we universalize it, um, it leads to bad stuff. So, right, I mean, when we get into real moral quandaries, categorical imperative might help us more than it does with just sort of day-to-day, -day, you know, do I want Big Mac or Whopper decisions? I don't know why I'm focused on fast food so much. I, don't, I really don't eat it that much. Um, yeah, does that make sense? Questions? The loophole. Imagine, imagine that I am broke again. I don't know why I keep using that example. Oh, wait, yes, I do. Um, imagine I'm broke and I decide, you know what would be a good way to get some money is to rob a bank. And then I universalize my maxim of I'm going to rob a bank. And how does that work out? Right. If everybody robbed banks, there'd be no banks to rob. There'd really be no system of like security, and we couldn't do all the things that banks do. It would all fall apart. So robbing a bank, probably a bad idea, according to the categorical imperative. But remember what I talked about, that we can, we can apply sort of circumstances, right? Like it's okay to speed if you've got a lady giving birth in the back seat. So what if uh, it's okay to rob banks, right? Well, I, right, it's not okay to rob banks. But I have right, a special circumstance. Like, I'm not just broke, but I have a kid who needs medication that I need to pay for. And so uh, I really need the money. Can't get a job, whatever. So uh, I'm going to rob the bank. 
Right? And so we can start to imagine, well, maybe we are comfortable with universalizing a maximum of something like if you're broke, people who are broke and really need the money rob banks. Well, that's not going to destroy banks, right? That's just a small, right? It would, it would affect some banks, but not the banking system entirely. Wouldn't lead to a logical impossibility. So maybe we're okay with that. I don't know. That doesn't seem right. But we can get right. We can really start to get crazy with this, right? My name is Joe. I work at a gas station, or I used to until I got fired because it went out of because it closed, right? I date a girl named Virginia. She goes to a community college. Uh, I like to wear denim, and my favorite album is Metallica's Master of Puppets. I, I don't know why denim and Metallica go together in my mind, but they do. Um, and so my maxim is this. If your name is Joe and you used to work at a gas station and you date a girl named Virginia who goes to community college and you like denim and you like Metallica, then you can rob banks. And if I universalize that maxim, the world's totally cool because how many people can that possibly apply to? Maybe just me, I might be the only Joe. So I universalize that maxim and all is well. The universe doesn't come crashing down. The banking system doesn't end. That seems like a perfectly good maxim to universalize without causing bad problems. So it's okay for me, Joe, to go rob that bank. How does that feel? <laughs> or everyone would just come up with their own very specific maxim, which is a little simpler than naming all of our kids Joe. <laughs> uh, what does that mean? What is it? What is the what do we have to be wary of then? Yeah, right. And so what we have to we have to kind of get a sense of right avoiding people like creating these loopholes that are so specific, maxims that are so narrow that even if we universalize them would hardly apply to anybody. Right? So the question becomes, how many people does a maxim have to apply to in order for it to be a good maxim? Right? Because we've already established that sometimes there are conditions, right? There are circumstances that make it okay, right? That can change a maxim slightly. We're not saying, and we're not in the position of like, don't kill people. That's my maxim. All right? I think we're, we could be comfortable saying, don't kill people unless you are in mortal danger yourself, becoming a maxim. Right? Because if if everybody lived by that rule, would be be comfortable? Would everybody be okay with that rule? You being universal, every single person in the world living that way? I think so. Right? And so that seems like an okay condition. But clearly there are some conditions that are too specific, too, too narrowing. And so how do we know when a condition is too narrowing and when it isn't? When it doesn't apply to the vast majority, what's the vast majority? Okay, what's the mass majority? 50%? 51%? 99%? Yeah, I don't know, right? It's hard. It's hard. I mean, the the vast majority of people are not in danger of being killed at any given moment. Right? And so, right, yeah, it might be. It's, it's possible right now that, you know, as this guy's bearing down on me with a machete, that I'm the only person in the world right now in imminent danger of being hacked apart by a machete. And so... Am I, am I universalizing a maxim that only applies to me? That doesn't seem right. I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure either. I'm not sure the, how, we, how we establish this. It does seem to be something along the lines of uh, making sure that it is a maxim that does apply to everybody, at least conditionally. Right? As soon as you say, people named Joe, you've cut out 98, 99 point something percent of the population, because how many Joes can there possibly be in the world? Um, and so that seems too narrow right there. Right? Um, I think it's complicated in that we have to be careful, right? Is being broke a good enough reason to rob a bank? Well, I mean, <laughs> well, we're not even worried about laws, right? I should have probably talked to, that actually brings up a good point that I need to remember for next time I teach this class. At the beginning of the class, right, I talked about how we're not going to rely on, like, the Bible says so, and therefore it's so, 
we should also, I should also talk about the law says so and therefore it's so, right? We definitely know that there are things, such things as like unethical laws, right? We can, we can name some, and we can also know that some things are unethical even if they're legal, right? Like lying seems like a bad thing even though there's not technically a law against it unless you're in court. Um, so, right, the, we, okay, so I, just for the purpose of thoroughness, I'll say it now. Law does not necessarily equal ethics, right? Um, I don't know. I don't know. It's it's hard. There's clearly not a simple like applies to 97% of people, so it's okay. 96%? No. Right? There's no no exact mathematical way to approach this, unfortunately. Um, Kant at the time just said, "Well, be reasonable." Right? Remember, his whole thing is based on human rationality and thought, and he believed strongly. Right, because this is 18th century, and everybody's just sort of coming up with this idea of what reason means. And he believed that everybody was capable of reason, and everybody used it the same way. And so if we thought about it hard enough, we'd all come to the same point of what made sense without having to spell it out. We'd just get there. Now, we know now that we don't all think the same way, and there are lots of different cognitive ways of approaching things, and it's not that simple. But, um, but Kant did believe that if we all just thought about it, we'd come to the same spot. Which leads us to the, same, the next question. What does it mean to be rational? What is rationality? Do we, in fact, all have the same goals for our society and ourselves? A great example of this is terrorists. Right? Imagine the, what a terrorist, what kind of maxim a terrorist is willing to universalize. All right? If I am, I mean, I don't have to, I don't want to specify terrorists, but oh, let's, so let's go back to, I will. Let's go back to Timothy McVeigh, all right? Oklahoma City bomber, what was that 90 something? I don't know. Yeah, something. Bomb, Oklahoma City, boom. Killed a lot of people, children, uh, totally innocent folk out in the federal building. Um, we probably all in this room think that that was not a good thing to do, to set off a bomb and kill a whole bunch of people. And he killed a whole bunch of people. But if we asked him, in fact, right, we, we did, right? he was interrogated after and questioned why he did this. He truly felt that what he was doing was the right thing. He felt that the government was actually killing people and doing all sorts of crazy conspiracy stuff that was leading to the deaths of innocents, and he felt that he was fighting back. And so we can imagine a world in which Timothy McVeigh says, well, am I comfortable universalizing a maxim in which everybody who feels like they are being oppressed or attacked by their government fights back with violent means? He might have been okay with that, actually. Right? And then we can also, right, we can apply that to more modern day terrorist activities, right? If those people believe in that what they're fighting for is worth killing and or dying for, then they might feel like that's a perfectly good maxim, one worth universalizing. But that, again, might not seem initially like something we're willing to agree to. Does that make sense? That seems like a problem. Seems like a problem. Is everybody clear on that problem? Because that's a little bit tricky, I think. Is there a response to it? Is there a way that Kant can respond to that worry that you can imagine? Well, I'm going to give you guys a break in a second. I didn't realize we'd been going for so long. Um, I don't know if there's a great response. I think that if, if I were Kant, remember I was just talking about his idea of how we all kind of think the same way because we're human beings? I think he'd say that those people had, their reason was broken. Like those people are insane, is I think what Kant would respond. Right? That they can't possibly, that they're actually wrong for wanting to kill people and they are fundamentally incapable of reason. I don't know if that's a great answer. Tracy, you don't seem to think that that's a good answer. Um, I think that, I mean, his, he's going to say, anybody who's willing to kill a bunch of people 
must have right a, a screw loose, right? something like that. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, yeah, right. I mean, they can obviously they can rationalize it. Rationalize, right? That that word built around the idea. Obviously, they can rationalize that that behavior, um, and presumably, I mean, it's hard to say that people are evil, right? They probably think what they're doing is good, and so, and this is one of those ways where you can imagine that that could happen, right? You can see where those people might think that that's uh, appropriate behavior, rather than just I know this is wrong, but I don't care. That's not something people do very often, right? Um, it, rather, instead, what people mostly do is, you might not think this is good, but you're wrong. It is good, and I'm going to do it anyway. Um, yeah, this is a hard thing to get past. Uh, remember, Kant is living in Europe, 18th century. He doesn't have a lot of exposure to other cultures or around the world. He was very well read, very well educated person, but it's not like he had ever been to North America or Africa or Asia or anything like that. He hasn't experienced all of these different cultures. He, he has a very, a fairly limited range of, of, of societal norms around him. And so he may have really believed that, of course, everybody is aiming for the same type of society because, because of course they are. I don't know. He has problems with that, I think. Um, finally, final exception. This is a great exception. He actually brings this up in his, in his book as, uh, as a, an example of what he says is a reason why the categorical, categorical imperative is a good thing. Um, imagine, right? We're on fun of, I'm full of these imagines, right? Imagine that your best friend pounds on your door in the middle of the night and you answer it, and you're like, what? And she says, there's a crazy axe-wielding maniac following me. Uh, I need to hide in your, in your broom closet. And you're like, okay, because she's your best friend, and she's being chased by an axe-wielding maniac. And you're like, sure. And then you call the police, but you know, they're not going to be there right away. So you're like, yeah, hide. And you close the door. And then a couple seconds later, boom, 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 crazy axe-wielding maniac is on the door. Like he's full on, like he's got an axe and a mask with the hockey blood and the whole thing, right? He's clearly an axe-wielding maniac. And he says, hi, I'm looking for your best friend. I'm going to chop her up with his axe. What do you do? And Kant, right, what do you do? You lie, you know, she went that way, right, is what you say. That's the obvious response. Kant says, no, no, because how do we feel about lying? <laughs> lying is bad. Always. <laughs> All right? Lying is bad. <laughs> exactly. She, oh, she's, yeah, she's in that closet. Is what he, honestly, what Khan expects you to do. He does. Because, um, because, 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 if we imagine a world in which people lie, then society breaks down because we can't communicate with each other. All right? And so lying is bad. Always, without exception, bad. Right. <laughs> right, right. She should have known better. It's like, oh no, wait. She's a Kantian. <laughs> run, run somewhere else. That's right. Um, well, but there's a reason, right? There's a reason why Kant believes this. Remember the remember the neighbors that burned down the house. If you if if things go well, then you right. You get maybe a nice fruit cake from your neighbor. Like, thank you for heating up my house, and, and I really appreciate it, and so on. If things go poorly and the house burns down, are you going to be arrested for arson? No. Your intent was good, right? So Kant believes that when we focus on intent, if you had goodwill, that you are not responsible for the consequences. Right? You can't be held responsible for the consequences of your actions. So if you, if you are, right, but, but if you don't have goodwill, you are responsible. If you went over there, right, to, with that, that house thing, and you're like, I'm going to turn on this furnace for my neighbors. Oh, no, it's clearly broken. Oh, well, right, and you walk out, right, you clearly did not have goodwill. You are not trying to help your neighbor. Then, then yes, you are responsible for the consequences of your actions. You led to that house being burned down. You did a bad thing. If you tell the truth and the axe wielder comes in and kills your friend, that's not your fault or problem. You 
are not responsible for the consequences of your actions if you act morally. However, however, imagine this, imagine these circumstances. Nah. So I'm changing the circumstances a little bit. Turns out your closet has a window in it, which you knew about, but your friend didn't. She runs into the closet to hide. She sees the window. She's like, oh. she jumps out the window and around the house. You, meanwhile, answer the door. Axe Wielder says, where's your friend? You're like, I haven't seen her. Or I did. She went that way. Axe Wielder goes, okay. Goes that way, finds her, and kills her because she just ran outside of the building. All right? Now, you are now responsible for her dying because you lied. You, well, you, I mean, you wouldn't if you were acting well, but maybe you decide to this one time, I'm going to be bad. I'm going to lie. And then it leads to her dying. And that's your fault. You're responsible. But you don't know what's going to happen, right? You can't predict, just like the problem with utilitarianism, right? We can't predict the future. We can't base our actions on maybe, maybe. But the fact is, to Kant, <laughs> oh, now we're not going to, you're not going to let your best friend in when there's an axe wielding murderer chasing her? Okay, hold on. Chelsea. Yes. That's right. Well, he doesn't want to kill you for whatever reason. Yeah, right. So, so yeah, I mean, there's a different, there are all sorts of ways you could play this out, right? If you say she's in the closet because you are just trying to protect yourself, that's, that's intent is bad. And we're going to get to that in, actually after the break. We're going to talk a little bit about why that's bad. Um, but, uh, but if you're, if you're, if your intent is to just follow the rules, right, because you know that lying is a bad maxim to universalize, then it's not your fault that this crazy guy, right, you've done everything, you've, you are like, I call the police, I'm hoping to get here before this guy kills my best friend, but what I can't do is lie because then I'm acting with bad will. Well, it's too late, you've already opened the door. All right, so let's take a break. Uh, stretch your legs, go into a room that isn't a million degrees uh, and, and or get a drink or something. And then we'll pick back up here in like, let's say seven minutes. Let's start back up at eight because I still have a couple things I want to talk about and I don't want to keep you guys late. Seven is what I meant to say, seven, seven o'clock, seven o'clock. <laughs>